Welcome everybody to a special episode of D-Town TV. This episode is dedicated specifically to one thing, the Nikon D4, and we're actually shooting a live episode with the D4. Now, the D4 is a phenomenal piece of equipment and I thought that it'd be a good time for us to talk about this with people who know it better than anybody else, the folks over at Nikon Professional Services. So here we have Scott Dusa. Scott, how are you? RC. And we have Bill Pekela. RC, pleasure. And we have Mark Subin. So, hi guys. <laughs> now, uh, thanks for coming and taking time out of your schedule to come here. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the D4 because it is a bit of a difference between the D3S, right? The, the evolution of it is, is, is actually a little bit better. RC, the, um, the D4, we think, are in the professional market is going to do the same thing that the D3 and then the D3S did. This is our new flagship camera. Okay. This, uh, you know, the D3 came out about three and a half years ago. Okay. D3S, sort of an interim, added some video into it. Uh, the D4 is the latest and greatest. Has a lot of new features on the still side and a lot of new features on the video side, which we think most people are going to be interested That's in. That's right. And it's, it's now more than ever, I think, you're looking at this from a standpoint of Photography's kind of evolved where individuals are having to do more and more mixed media stuff. They're going out and they're shooting and they're doing stills and they're doing all of that stuff, but they also have to start including video and the demands for video have gotten a lot bigger in that they need 1080p, they need faster frame rates, all of these kinds of things. And I think that that's where you're gonna notice that the D4 happens to be a phenomenal companion to be able to capture that. So let's do a little bit of a tail of the tape. I have my D3S here. Right, and you have the D4. And I have my D4. Oh, you have the D4 there. Here, actually, I'll pass that down so that you guys can have it over there, and I'll just kind of talk to you guys about it. Because the D3S was a 12 megapixel camera, correct? Correct. And the D4 is a 16.2 megapixel. Okay, so that that part's increased on that. And um, now the ISO. How does the ISO work? ISO has been up, bumped up again. The native ISO in the camera is ISO 100 through ISO 12,800. Okay. And then you, you can... Right, and then we have high and low. We have low uh, one, which would be a 50 equivalent. Okay. And then high one, two, three, and now four, which will give us a top end ISO of 204,000 and change. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that entire, the entire concept of just, go, ah, I'm just going to go shoot at 204,000. It's something that, it, it's just unheard of. Now, high ISO, what does that help us? How does that help us in, in, in the photography space? Well, obviously, the higher the ISO, providing the quality of the image is good, gives you the ability to have more control over both shutter speed and f-stop. Okay. So a sports photographer, for instance, high ISO means being able to record a sporting event at a much higher shutter speed than what he would be with a lower ISO. Right. Therefore, action stopping ability. Right, right, right. Uh, in the world of forensic photography, which Nikon is a very big player in, uh, 204,000 ISO is the equivalent of being able to shoot surveillance photography without having to use light intensifier scopes and things like that. Um, and even in the realm of uh, theatrical performances and mm -hmm. things where you're working in low light and, and can't control the light, obviously the higher the ISO you can go, the more choices you have as far as bringing home the photo. Right, and that's one of those things that, that I really kind of, uh, as a D3S owner, I, I've kind of relied on having really, really high ISO to make the shot, right? So like I do a lot of dance and theater stuff. So being able to capture a jump I wanted to make sure that I increased ISOs and I wanted something to be clean, which is why I went to the D3S. Mm -hmm. Now the D4 is kind of taking that. It does. It takes it at least a full step more. So the ISO where you would have shot at 6400, for instance, you can now safely assume that you can shoot at that 12,800. Wow. Jeez. And that's one extra step on the shutter speed scale or one extra aperture if you need it. Now, Scott, I know you're, you're a concert shooter. So I, I mean, am, yes, absolutely. So, so. Th That's one of those things that <laughs> it, it speaks very, very well to you. Yeah, I mean, even in concerts, though, I mean, one of the things that I need is frames per second as well. And this thing can do 10 frames per second. Oh, okay. And it can shoot a lot of raw files in a row. The buffer on this is incredible. And depending on how fast the cards are in the camera, which maybe we'll talk a little bit more about cards in a moment, um, you can get a lot of raw files in a row before the camera starts to stall. Right. So when it comes to concerts, yeah, that's going to be a really huge um, factor for me for shooting raw files. Now, you mentioned the entire card thing. So let's start. there's two types of cards, though, right, inside of it. Correct. There's Correct. the compact flash card, and then there's the Sony XQD format. Correct. Now, wh why, why those two? Well, new, new format. Um, 
compact flashcards have been around for about 12 years. Okay. Um, they were here when digital photography first got started. Uh, they have progressed through all of the years that the improvements in the cameras have made, but there are limitations to them. And the big limitation is the, the right speed to the card. Okay. Uh, as cameras record more data, and that data needs to be offloaded onto these cards, that's where the speed of the card comes into play. The new XQD cards, they're a smaller format, they're rugged, just like a compact flash card, right, right. not like a, a, a secure digital card, nice card, but you know, really sort of a plastic chip. This is a metal encased card. Mm -hmm. These cards start in speed of recording where the top end of the compact flash cards leave off. Okay. Uh, and in capacities, these cards have the ability, it's a, it's a new format by the compact card flash card industry, and it has the ability to go up to two terabytes in size. Wow. So as the files get bigger, the cameras record more and more data, the video requirements get more demanding, these cards will pick up where the old cards left off. And that was, a, that was an important distinction because I think that if you're looking at it as a still shooter and you're working with you know, files and transferring, you might say to yourself, oh, well, you know, the, the card that I have is kind of okay. But how that's does that why apply? We, that's why we kept that in the camera. Exactly. So you don't necessarily have to just go and switch everything out. Your compact flash can deal with all of that. And if you need something that's more demanding, I'll say video. Mm -hmm. Video would be something that you would put into Correct. the uh, you can put into the XQD. So so that's good. It, it kind of keeps you future proof a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. So all right. So that's so that's a good thing. Ergonomically, things have changed a little bit. A couple of things that I thought that were really really cool for me. So I'm I'm excited about that. Tell us about that. Well, the the, the nice thing about Nikon cameras over the years uh, is that you can pick up the camera and the controls fall basically where you think they should fall. Okay. We have changed the ergonomics of the camera. There's a little bit more of a slope to the shutter release button area. Okay. But because of that slope, we've also tilted the, the sub-command wheel up. So it makes a, a lot easier to make that movement when you need to move it. Mm -hmm. um, little things that the end user will never notice is the thermal coating that's on the camera. You know, black oh. cameras, hot Florida sun, uh, right. or anywhere where it gets, gets hot, heat builds up in the camera. This is the thermal coating on top of the magnesium diecast uh, alloy that actually reflects that heat and keeps the camera from getting so hot. Uh, other that's controls on the camera, uh, all of the buttons now, when you turn on the illuminator, you're not just illuminating the display on the back of the camera, you're illuminating the buttons. So photographers that have to work in low light, yeah. this is a big deal, right, Scott? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of those things, like I do, a lot of, I do a lot of HDR stuff, and in the middle, like I'm at night and I'm trying to do all of this stuff and I'm fumbling with it, and, and I think that that addressed two specific things. And uh, keep in mind that the details, these little details matter when you're out actually working with this. I'm always telling people, when you're working with your camera, you want to feel like you can command everything from your camera blindly. You want to be able to put your camera down, you want to be able to access all of your controls as fast as you can, and when you put your camera to your eye, you want to be able to access all of those same controls as fast without having to go into the menus and dig through all of that kind of stuff. This, these little changes make them a lot easier for you to be able to do, especially if you're sitting in the middle of the night and you want to be able to try to find something, hitting an illuminator button and seeing what lights are there, that kind of stuff really does kind of take it to the next level. So I thought that, that was, I thought those were really, really good additions that you had for that. Now, autofocus has also been changed. It has. Right? How, what are we talking about on our autofocus standpoint here? <laughs> well, autofocus, um, all of our cameras up until this point have been able to autofocus with lenses as slow as f5.6 or faster. Okay. okay, so it's not some autofocus sensors work at 2.8 and some work at f4 and then a few work at f5.6. All 51 autofocus points in the D3 series cameras and the D300 and D700 cameras have worked from f5.6 on down. The D4 now has 11 of those autofocus points that actually work from f8. Nice. Down. Okay. So think about a photographer using a 200 to 400 f4 lens or a 500 or a 600 f4 lens that puts a 2x teleconverter on it that now has got an f8 aperture as a maximum aperture. Other autofocus systems, unless there's really bright light, maybe won't be able to keep up with autofocus you know, really well, D4 can do it. 
Okay. So you got the sports photographer on the sidelines shooting a 600 f4 with a 2x teleconverter. You get 11 autofocus sensors working 100% with this camera. Nice, very very cool. Uh, let's see what else. What now? We've talked about that stuff. The smaller things that you may not necessarily see when you're looking at that individually. A couple of changes in the HDR thing. All right, what I like to call HDR. Obviously, you guys are gonna call them bracketing. There were some changes in bracketing. Uh, Mark, talk to us a little bit about the changes in bracketing. We used to be able to do, I think, two stops, correct? Yeah, now you can do three stops, and the okay. camera allows you to do the auto bracketing in the camera. You can set your number of frames you'd like to do, but now you have the ability to do, when you change your sub-command dial, to change your stops up to three stops. Okay, so really you, can do, you can do seven, nine, can, I don't know, can you do nine? I think oh, sure. you can, yeah. Yeah, you could do nine. Yeah, so nine frames, three stops of exposure. Uh, you could do five frames of three stops, and then you could do th um, uh, three frames of three stops. That's just right amazing. There. I mean, so. to be able to capture all of that detail, and, and, and the application, like we talked about this over lunch, a lot of the times, obviously I'm gonna throw this into HDR, because that's, you know, that's where I'm gonna go. But a lot of the times I would shoot and then I would turn around and say, well, well, this frame I don't need, or this frame I don't need. I'm gonna get rid of this one, I'm gonna get rid of this one. Being able to get to the heart of the matter by just kind of just taking the shots that I need three stops apart is something that I think that's very, very beneficial. If you can save me a couple seconds here, a couple seconds there, a megabyte here, a megabyte there, that kind of stuff really does pay attention. But you also do HDR in the camera. Yes, you can also take the camera and put it in JPEG mode, and when you're in JPEG, you can actually go through the menus and select to do a series of HDRs, or you can do the next photo to be an HDR. And what happens is the camera basically will do a single mirror clack. You hear the mirror clack up, but you hear double exposure. So it's actually taking two pictures with that one mirror up and down. So you end up with a merged picture of those two. Nice. Now, is that crunchy? Like super crunchy? Like no, it's pretty fast. It's actually it, well, you can set the smoothing, and you can also set the the EV off, offset for up to three stops. So you have some control. I, I wouldn't say it's really edgy, but it, it does give you more dynamic range to work with. Nice, very very cool. Now look, all of the stuff that we've talked about here is still just on the shooting side of it. It's not that we're not, and it's not that we're ignoring it. I just wanted to save the part that I'm really really excited about for this one next section. Why don't we do this? Let's take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk to you guys about the same camera, the Nikon D4, the one that you're seeing right now on a shoot, but I want to talk to you about it from a video standpoint. Stick around. Hi, my name's Dave Black. We're working with sports action using speed lights. We started out track and field with a sprinter coming out of the starting blocks. Then we got some great feature shots of baseball from a variety of angles. Had beautiful twilight sky behind him, and then we'd like re-illuminate him with a speed light setup. We moved on to faster action with motocross, where we had three great professional motocross riders for us on a super course. We used a combination of cross light with the sunshine and then the speed lights coming in to make a real dynamic look. It's exciting. You'll learn a lot. So come to KelbyTraining.com and watch my sports action with speed lights video. We'll see you there. Welcome back everybody. Our special episode based entirely on the Nikon D4 and shot right on the D4. Again, we have Mark Subin, we have Bill Pakela, and we have Scott Diusa all from Nikon Professional Services here to be able to kind of fact check <laughs> while I talk a little <laughs> bit about this. Because I could sit there and I'll start gushing and I'm going on and on. We've been talking about this for a while. We're like, oh my God, the D4, it could do this, it could do that. I didn't want to come out here and just start saying, it can do this, it can do that, without kind of going, uh, it can shoot video, right? It can do this yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. So on the first segment, what we did is we spent some time talking a little bit about how the D4 is a phenomenal camera on the photography and on the shooting side. The fact of the matter is, when you're going out on the internet, if you're shooting by yourself, if you're shooting for somebody, if you're shooting for clients, more and more you're beginning to hear this entire mixed media thing. I need pictures, but I need you to do some video. I need some video and I need you to interplay some stills. I need you to put slideshows together that incorporate video and images. And while I appreciated what the D3S can do, I always thought to myself that in the back of my head that they were gonna take it to the step to the next level. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the next level when it comes to stuff on video with the Nikon D4. So take us through that. 1080, 
Do we have 1080? We got 1080. Beautiful. We're there. Wonderful. Done. Now, oh, frames on that, frame rates. Well, actually, well, I mean, the evolution from the D3S to the D4 has been all because people like yourself said, you know what, this camera's doing great, but I want this. And one of the things they wanted besides um, 1080p was they wanted variable frame rates. We have 24, 25 if you're in Europe shooting PAL system, and 30 frames per second okay. on 1080p. You also have 60 frames per second when you're shooting 720p, so you could do some really great slow motion type video as well. Now, and there's some stuff out there already that's kind of taken advantage of that. I mean, if you think, I, I think, I thought, and I could be wrong, I thought that some of the stuff that was in Corey Rich's video that he had talked about, was sh some of that was shot in you know, 60 frames. Yeah, so. Absolutely, yeah, Corey was, we were just talking to him recently about it. Another thing, speaking of Corey's video, uh, one <laughs> of the greatest things that the D4 has that no other digital SLR camera on the market has now is the ability to have a headphone out, to be able to plug headphones into this, plug a microphone in, headphone out, and get full manual audio metering and control on the back of the camera itself. And so, it doesn't sacrifice a port or anything like that, it's just... No, it's an extra port right on the side, so you've got a dedicated headphone out, so you can monitor all of the sound coming into this microphone. And what I said about Corey is, I asked Corey, I said, hey, your movie, you know, how did you record the sound? He says, well, we recorded it through the camera, and I also did dual audio. I did a second recorder as well. I had a handheld recording device. He says, never even used it. Never needed those files. Everything straight from the camera was just right on the money, and he used all the sound on the video wow. from the camera, so wow. he didn't need a second recording device. Wow. Now, uh, on top of that, uh, there was also something that I saw that, that I thought was really interesting. He, was, he, he played a little bit with time-lapse, and I think that we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. some of the stuff that you can do with time-lapse, which I thought was really, really cool. Take us through that. Well, the camera basically has a built-in intervalometer, which most Nikon cameras have had for a number of years now, okay. including our D7000, for example. Okay. Uh, but this particular camera has a, a really great feature in the fact that it has a built-in time-lapse feature. So you basically can set the camera up for intervalometer-type photography, but instead of saving a bunch of JPEGs to your card, it actually compiles the movie on the fly. So as you take the pictures and you sit back and take a nap, let the time-lapse develop, pictures are taken one at a time and then the movie is actually being made. So even if you interrupt the video, or in this case to still movie mode, when you, when you, when you stop it from uh, doing a time lapse, it actually finishes the movie so you're, you're done. Or you can let it go to complete up to seven hours and when you're done you have a three, four, five, six minute video. Now, time lapse can be a very, very intensive thing on the computer side, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're taking a lot of images and you're putting the images together and you're stitching them, that could be something right. that it can take a little bit of time. Requires you not to have a computer with you. All of that stuff can just be done right on the, so I wanted to make sure that we covered that because I thought that was really, really cool. So you have an audio, to, you have input, and you can monitor, mm -hmm. right? Other things that we have here is um, you have the ability to be able to take HDMI out, uncompressed. Yes, you can actually, right off the side of the camera, one of the ports is an HDMI port, and when you take the cards out of the camera and hook the HDMI at, out to an external device, you can actually record full 1080p uncompressed video to an external unit and videographers were, were loving that. Okay. Very and, and RC, in addition to that, there is a custom setting that allows you to move, remove all of the camera overlay information, which has oh. been a big problem in the, in the industry. You know, it's nice to get a good, clean HDMI signal out, but it's virtually useless if you have camera information on top of it. This is a clean signal without that information. Right, in fact, the video you're watching now is a clean HDMI out. We basically took it out of the camera into the broadcast setup that they have here, and it's pretty much good to go. But you can also still monitor your video with all the information on it on the back of the camera, so the camera operator sees all the important info, such as, you know, um, shutter speed, aperture, audio levels, all of that, but the HDMI out coming out doesn't have any of that information on it, and you can see both at the same time. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. So, so we have all of this option for video. We have one more, th I, there is one more thing that I do want to cover with you guys, and that is the WT5, because that's gonna kind of do a little bit more video stuff and talk a little bit about what this WT5 is. I saw this when the, when the D4 was coming out, and I was just like, I don't know, I, I don't know. And for me, this is gonna be kind of the, the sleeper feature that's kind of taken it yet to the next level. Just to be able to show you, there's nothing up my sleeve. All I have here is a Verizon Incredible 2 phone. 
just v Android. Now, tell me a little bit about the WT5. Well, the camera itself has network con connectivity right out of the box. It has a has a 10100 Ethernet port on the side of the camera. So the features that we're going to talk about that the WT5 can do, we can also do out of the Ethernet port. So WT5 allows you to do this, of course, without wires. wires. So you can connect to, we're connected to the Kelby wireless network right now. Right. So if we didn't have a wireless network, I could plug directly from the Ethernet port into my computer, if my computer will do the auto switching for me, or into a router. So the neat thing is, is that the camera has one of the greatest features about the camera that I particularly like is that it has a built-in web server. So out of the box, the camera can basically serve up whatever images or video is on the card. So as you take pictures, you can browse the camera, look at the images, and in some cases, go through there and download select pictures. So you, you can shoot live. And as you look at your web page, your web page refreshes with the latest pictures. So basically, when, when they say a web surfer, what you would be doing is you would be grabbing something like an iPad. So uh, now, Bill, you have an iPad there, right? Yes. And you have it connected to the address. In this case, we have a specific address that's dialed in for that. Correct. Now, on that iPad, can, you can log in. What do, what do you see there right now? Well, right now I have a, a, a set of menus. One is the shooting and viewing menu, but it's important to know that only one computer can control the camera at one time. Okay. So all I'm able to do now, because he has control of the computer, is I can go into the view mode, okay. and I can look at the images as they're being shot. Now think of this as a photographer out there on the job with the client looking over your shoulder. You know, you're in the studio shooting, the photographer is doing his thing, and without interruption, the client can be monitoring the images as they're being shot. So you can and hand them an iPad, and you can just turn around and say, here, watch all of the stuff as I'm working somewhere else. Correct. Or on your phone, oh. iPad, iPhone. Right, because, oh, take a look, so look at that. Do you say you're holding same, the same, same connection setup. right here. You're watching the same thing I'm there. I'm also connected, too. And that was one of the things that when I, when I was taking a look at the video online, I saw that a lot of the times people were like, well, I, that's great if you have an iPad, and that's great if you have an iPhone, but does it work? Keep in mind that these, these web servers are serving this stuff up in HTML5 compliancy. So I have this incredible, and this incredible allows me to do the same thing. I can go in there, and I can watch right with this. So it doesn't necessarily have to deal with an OS standpoint. It's OS independent. Correct. And you have the option to have multiple devices, phones, tablets, computers, connect and watch what's happening on, on, on the actual camera. Yeah, that's a really great feature. And in this case, on the iPad, we can even use the iPad to control the camera. So maybe the camera's a remote. Maybe I've set it up on the end of a, uh, you know, maybe for a remote picture for football or baseball or someplace up in the stands. I can actually put the camera in live view and monitor what the camera sees through the live view, through the web feed from the camera. So this is all going to be dependent on your bandwidth. So if you're on a slow network, the camera does also have the ability to put it in a QVGA mode. So it kind of dumbs down the look for the live view, but it does allow you to compose the photo, focus by tapping on the screen to select your focus point. And then when you go out of live view, then of course you can even take a picture if you wanted to remotely with it by just touching the iPad. Nice. So there's some uh, real, uh, really a lot of great features. But the best part, of course, is being able to browse. And that's just one of the features of the network. And of course, you can do standard FTP. So if you work for a newspaper or a magazine, you could connect in, put in your FTP username, password, and of course, select pictures or send everything, or even have this as a remote to send auto send pictures to your editor. Wow. So you could be sending stuff. You could be sending your job as you're driving on your way home if you have a you could. wireless connection. You could. So anyway. Those, all of those kinds of things, I think, are things that make the D4 kind of a standout camera for most of this stuff. And when we work with these things, what we do is we lean very, very heavily on the organization, Nikon Professional Services, to get us up to speed, to make sure that our gear is right, for us to be able to uh, make solid purchasing decisions on the things that we want to do. I didn't want to necessarily close out the show without talking about that, because I think that that's an invaluable service if you own professional cameras and you want to make sure that you're protected. Bill, talk to us a little bit about NPS. Uh, NPS was started back in 1973. Okay. Um, and it was started as a support function. Okay. You know, like any big company, if you don't get a hold of the right people, you don't necessarily get answers or even return phone calls. NPS was the sort of go-to source for full-time photographers out there making their living with Nikon gear. 
And I've had the pleasure of being in that position now since 1980. It's a fun job. Um, we are simply dedicated to making sure that guys like you and other professionals that are out there shooting with Nikon gear on a full-time basis have the support they need when new information becomes available. We want you to have it. If you have an equipment malfunction of any type, we want to be there and be ready to support you either with loaner gear or an expedited repair. Uh, average repair time, by the way, for an NPS repair is about four to five days. Uh, and if it's really tight, we can loan you something to, to use while that repair is being done. And of course, it's a free service, uh, which is why it's really only available to full-time professionals. That's sort of the, the preliminary right there, earning their living with Nikon gear. Nice, so it's, it's this added net. Think about it as if you're out there and you're shooting Nikon gear, understand that you're supported education, technology, loaner gear, all of that stuff, you get it for free from Nikon Professional Services. Now, on behalf of myself and the rest of the Cowboy Media organization, thank you so much, guys, for coming down because I know that your schedule is very, very busy with the release of this. This has only been two weeks since this past Friday, right? Correct. So I thank you so much for coming by and actually bringing some out for us to be able to play with. No, we're not giving one away. <laughs> We'd like to be able to do that, but no. Scott would actually have me washing dishes if that would happen. But we do appreciate the time and we do appreciate the information. So on behalf of myself and MPS, thank you so much. We'll see you guys next week.